Hear the word of God from the twelfth chapter of the Gospel of John. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival, there were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, my Father will honor. This is the word of the Lord. This morning's sermon title is a slightly altered version of a Latin phrase that I first learned a few years ago. With apologies to any Latin scholars out there, the phrase is dum vivimus servimus. While we live, we serve. It is the motto of Presbyterian College down in South Carolina reflecting the deep commitment of that school to making service a key component of every student's experience, instilling a passion for service into each graduating senior. It also reflects the call given to all who seek to follow Jesus Christ. While we live, we are commanded to serve. As long as we are alive, we are called to serve. And as the words of Jesus remind us this morning, when we offer ourselves in service to others, we discover what life is all about. That is, when we serve, we live, really live. Not long ago, someone sent me the link to an article with this title, Trappist Monk's Business Secrets Book Teaches Unconventional unconventional Path to Success. Well, that got my attention immediately. The article the story told was that of August Turak, a an entrepreneur, successful corporate executive who sold his two software companies that he founded in the year 2000, several years later, for $150 million. Still, Turek describes his life this way. I was one of those people who was very successful on the outside, but felt empty inside. A friend suggested that he visit the Mepkin Abbey Trappist Monastery, and there his life was transformed as he watched the monks live out their calling to dedicated and prayerful service. He was fascinated in the time that he observed and studied the monks by their ability, though a mostly elderly group of men, their ability to run 3,200 acres of land, a gift shop, a library, a conference center, an egg business, a timber business, a fertilizer business, and an oyster mushroom business. Turek studied this community closely and discovered what made it all possible, and and when he was asked about the monk's secret to success, this is how he replied, it's selflessness. 
When people feel they're on a mission from God, they accomplish incredible things and with a deep sense of satisfaction. Turek writes, we may think we want selfishness, but we're happiest not when indulging, but when we're being truly selfless. He goes on to say that great leaders are like that, that that once people realize that you're not in it for yourself, they begin to trust you and, and turn to you, and that's when you have power to achieve your goals and your mission. He closes with this pithy gem, the amount of trust you gain is directly proportionate to how selfless you are. I thought about that article when I read the words of Jesus we just heard. They are spoken near the end of his life, and that topic is clearly on his mind. In response to those who are searching for him, Jesus reflects on what matters the most. He uses the image of a grain of wheat to make his point. Like all seeds, that that single grain of wheat cannot bear fruit without first being planted in the earth. It must lose its life as a seed in order to fulfill its purpose of bearing fruit. And then Jesus says, the same is true of us. We must lose our lives in order to fulfill our purpose. It is a powerful and challenging truth. Following Jesus is not about satisfying our desires. The point of following Jesus is so that we might be drawn more deeply into God's kingdom through love, service, and sacrifice on behalf of others. Jesus himself demonstrates this. He comes to to show that God's strength is in vulnerability, that God's power is what appears weak in the eyes of the world, that God's justice comes through forgiveness and mercy, and then, having lived that story himself, he calls those who would follow him to serve him with that very same kind of life, that very same kind of love. If we want to live, we must serve. And so this morning we begin a season of commitment in the life of our congregation. We're going to spend these three Sundays considering together our God-given call to give. The theme we have chosen this year reflects a common topic in Scripture, but also the context of Second Presbyterian Church in the fall of 2018, a time of sowing seeds and nurturing possibilities. This morning, Jesus challenges us to lose ourselves in pursuit of what matters most. To lose ourselves in order to be who we were created to be, to do what we were created to do. So I wonder if you have ever had that that overwhelming feeling that that God was calling you to make a, a new commitment, to invest your gifts and talents in transformative ways. Have you ever been so passionate about a way to serve others that you have lost yourself? If you have, you know the thrill of such a feeling. Maybe God is calling to you in this chapter of life to make a fresh commitment, to lose yourself in something greater than yourself. 
Almost 35 years ago, a young couple made the decision to search for a church near their new home. Both members of the couple had been raised in the Christian faith. He was a cradle Lutheran, and she had been part of a Presbyterian congregation for as long as she could remember. And and together they found themselves searching for the kind of support and meaning that Christian community had provided them in the past that they had seen their parents enjoy growing up. They were also a young couple with a busy and full life, settling into a new town, new neighborhood, new jobs. Their two daughters were four years old and two years old, and they were brand new to the area. They knew they needed friends. They sensed that they needed a spiritual home to worship, a sacred space in which to raise their daughters, and perhaps above all, they knew that in this new chapter of life, they needed some way to serve, some way to to find meaning in giving back to others. And, And what they found was an empty cornfield on the southwestern edge of Kansas City, Kansas. After visiting and worshiping in other churches, they were intrigued by a a sign erected in that field that read, In this spot, a new church will be born. Below that was the temporary location, the address of an elementary school nearby, And so the next Sunday morning, the the family, it it, it happened to be Easter Sunday morning, the the family rose early, the couple did everything you have to do to get two young children ready for worship, and then they got into the car and they drove to that elementary school. They, They entered the doors of the school with absolutely no idea what to expect. It was the mid 80s. There was no website to check out beforehand. And this particular church had no building to drop by during the week. As soon as they walked in, the family was approached by a man holding a a large stack of paper and looking very relieved. Oh, good, he said. You're the ushers. I've got to get back to choir. Tim and Susan looked at each other and then down at their daughters and said, no, you have us mistaken. We're actually visitors. It's our first time here. The man smiled and handed, him, handed them the stack of bulletins saying, well, you're good enough. You know how to hand out bulletins. You can be our ushers today. A seed was sown, a a possibility was nurtured, and in the three and a half decades since that Sunday morning, the life of the Hayden family has centered on the life of Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. Their closest lifelong friends are fellow members. All four have been ordained to serve as a deacon or an elder, and, and through the support of that congregation, Sarah felt the call to seminary and now serves as a pastor and leader in our denomination. That church has given them friends, a sacred place to worship, a spiritual home for more than 30 years, and I think it's all because they were offered a way to serve. Now look, I pray that in this place of worship and community, each of you will find comfort and strength, peace in your soul, and hope for these chaotic days. I hope that here you will will find a sense of meaning that gives purpose to your life, but I also know that not far from here there are those who daily go without the basic necessities of living, and I know that we are called to serve them. 
I know that right here among us, there are those who have given up hope that anyone cares, and we are called to love them. I know that in our very city, there are those who live in constant fear of violence and that we have been called to act on their behalf. I know that not very far from us, there are those who are systematically left behind and shut out, and we have been called to speak up. I know that not far from us, there are those whose lives lack deep meaning even as they are surrounded by too many things, and we are called to invite them. Not far from us, there are those who need what we have. And not far from us, there are those who have what we need. And I know that we are the body of Christ that we have a divine call to live the faith we profess to reshape the world. The call to discipleship is that profound. It is to transform the world in Christ's name. And I also know that that transformation begins right here in this sacred and beautiful place, that our worship is the source of our call to serve and it is the purpose of our service. That is, that worship must always call us into mission and mission must always invite us back to worship. That rhythm of faithful living will form us ever more into disciples of Jesus Christ In two weeks, we will be invited to make our financial commitments for the year ahead. And I know that through your generous giving, Second Presbyterian Church will continue to be who it has ever been, will continue its commitment to mission and service, that that through your commitment we will continue to offer food and housing and clothing to those in deepest need. I, I know that we will continue to partner with those in our community who offer a voice of compassion and hospitality in a time of hatred and rejection. I know that we will continue to build homes and relationships and hope in many different ways. I know that your giving will enable all of this, that, that our giving is another invitation, another way to serve. This month, as I have listened to church members reflect on their reason for giving, I have heard this so clearly, that our commitment deepens our faith and our sense of belonging, that we give because this place offers us a way to serve, to use what we have in ways that matter, and they do matter. And so whether you go on a mission trip or teach a class or volunteer in the office or stock shelves in the pantry or visit homebound members or read books to children or give with a cheerful heart or sing or play an instrument or cook for those who have new babies or pray for one another or serve on a committee or lead in worship or yes, hand out bulletins and I see there is a need for ushers right now. I hope this place will always offer you a way to serve and that you will find meaning in that service. If you haven't yet found that place, I encourage you to do it. Because you will find that serving others brings deeper meaning to your own walk of faith in this community. Seven days ago, last Sunday morning, I had the opportunity to stand behind that communion table for the very first time in celebration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. But Karen Lang and I did not stand there alone. We were joined by two of the children of this congregation who so beautifully participated in that liturgy. As they did... I watched them. 
I saw the confidence, the joy they found in this leadership role. I saw a gleam in their eyes and I recognized it. It's what it looks like when the church says in no uncertain terms, you belong up here. You have a part to play. You can lead and bless us. Their church had given them a way to serve. Just imagine what might happen because of that invitation. A seed sown, a possibility nurtured. Second Presbyterian Church, what we do here, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, what we do here is the most important work in the world. When we serve, we lose that stranglehold that will only choke off our passion. When we serve, we discover life worth living. Amen.